Twitter files have dropped. Part one dropped with the legendary, award-winning, highly respected journalist, Matt Taibbi. If you don't know who he is, he is a left-leaning journalist who worked at Rolling Stone and did the best coverage, hands down, of the financial crisis and the shenanigans, and he held truth to power to that group. This is important to note. The second drop was given to Barry Weiss, who is a, a right-leaning independent journalist. These are both independent journalists. She previously worked at the New York Times itself. Now, I think we should work backwards from two to one. Do you agree? Yes, for sure. Let's start with the drop that just happened last night. Yes. So last night, a drop happened. So here's what happens in Twitter files part two. I'm going to give a basic summary and then I'm going to give it to Sachs because he's chomping at the bit. We now have confirmation that what the right thought was happening all along, which is a secret silencing system built into the software of blacklists was tagging right wing conservative voices in the system. And these included people like Dan uh, Bongino, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. He was tagged with being on a search blacklist. What that means is you're a fan of, of Dan's, who is a former Secret Service agent who is now a right wing conservative, I could just say conservative instead of wing, a conservative radio host, podcast host. He was not allowed to be found in search engines for some reason. Charlie Kirk, who is a conservative commentator, he was tagged with do not amplify. I guess that means you can't trend into people's feeds, even if they follow you. And then there were people who were banned from the trends blacklist, including a Stanford professor, Jay Bhattacharya. Did I get it right? Uh, yes, Jay Bhattacharya. Okay, I got it right. Doctor of okay. Stanford School of Medicine. And he was not allowed on the trends blacklist because he had a dissenting opinion. A Stanford professor had a, a dissenting, dissenting opinion. opinion on COVID that's turned out to be true. And this is where the danger comes in because all of these actions were taken without any transparency. And they were taken on one side of the aisle by people inside of Twitter, essentially covertly, no ownership of who did it. And they never told the people, they gaslit them. They could see their own tweets, they could use the service, but they couldn't be seen even by their own fans in many cases here. Sachs, when you look at that, let's just start with that first piece, the shadow banning as it's called uh, in our industry, where you can participate in a community, but you can't be seen. Are any, uh, is there any circumstance under which this tool would make sense for you to deploy? And then what's your general take on what has been discovered last night? Okay, look. Two-part question. Yes. What, let me start with what's been discovered here. Let me boil it down for you. This is an FTX level fraud, except that what was stolen here was not customer funds. It was their free speech rights. Not just the rights of people like Jay Bhattacharya and Dan Bongino to speak, but the right of the public to hear them in the way that they expected. Okay. And you had statement after statement by Twitter executives like Jack Dorsey, like Vijaya Gotti, like, you know, Yoel and others saying we do not shadow ban. And then they also said we certainly, this is their emphasis, do not shadow ban on the basis of political viewpoint. And what the Twitter files show is that is exactly what they were doing. They, in the same way that SBF was using FTX and customer funds as his personal piggy bank, they were using Twitter as their personal ideological piggy bank. They were going in to the tools and using the content moderation system, these big brother-like tools that, that were designed to basically put their thumb on the scale of American democracy and suppress viewpoints that they did not agree with and they did not like, even when even when they could not justify removing content based on their own rules. So there are conversations in the Slack that Barry Weiss exposed, where, for example, Libs of TikTok, they admit in the Slack that we can't suppress Libs of TikTok based on our hate policy. Libs of TikTok hasn't violated it. We're going to suppress that account anyway. Now, it's important to note what Libs of TikTok does. This is a great talking point. Libs of TikTok, finds uh, people who are trans, people who are, you know, maybe not LGBTQ, and they feature their TikToks 
and they mock them on Twitter. Now, this certainly is free speech. And the argument from the safety team was by putting all of these together, you're inciting violence towards those people. And they said they haven't broken a rule, but collectively, they could be in some way targeting those people. Is there anything fair, Friedberg, to that statement? That they targeted them? By collecting their, let's say, views that are, I'm, I'm asking this question for discussion purposes. I'm not giving my Jake opinion. Help. Hold on. I want Friedberg. Why to can't I one. finish? I, I'm going to go back to you. You spoke for two minutes. That's why. Friedberg. You turned down moderating today, Sax. You could have Everybody had the opportunity else gets to, to speak, speak as long as they want. And I get interrupted. You got two minutes. Let me Let just Friedberg finish the SBF. Let me just finish the SBF analogy, oh, okay? God, and then you Marty, can. The filibuster then you can, continues. Then you, can, go ahead. then you can both sides this Don't issue. Don't worry, Sax. While you're speaking, he'll Listen, drop one or two words on you. And then, yeah, go ahead. Why did people like Gotti and <laughs> Yoel deny that they were engaged in shadow banning, even though that's clearly what they were doing? Because they knew that they had an obligation to be stewards of the public trust. They were custodians of public trust. They knew they were violating that trust. The same way that SBF had a duty to be custodians of his customers' funds. Mm -hmm. They did not implement their own policy that they said they were implementing. Why? Because they were suppressing accounts that personally offended them that personally they disagreed with, and they wanted to deprive the public of the right to hear. Okay, so now, the way that they're you... justifying this, hold on, the way that the media is today justifying it is they're pointing to obscure provisions in the terms of use around spam accounts, things like that, saying, oh, well, the terms of use show that they had the right to do this. This is like the margin account, okay? They did not have the right to use these tools in this way, okay? The, Jay Bhattacharya was not posting spam, a Tell Stanford me where professor. A Stanford, He's a Stanford professor, doesn't, professor doesn't. Yes, and, and a talk show radio view, host. His who view disagree on COVID with, yes. has been proven correct completely. He was opposed yes. to lockdowns. That was the great Barrington Declaration, and they suppressed it. What is the justification so for that? So now you have to answer my question, then, Sachs, since you I want to talk so much. Hold on, mm. Sachs. I want you to answer the question, then, since you are so no, interested hold on, in talking. I, hold on, no, hold I on. Sachs, I want him to answer one question. Then it's going to you, Freeberg. Sachs, should libs of TikTok be able to collect uh, trans people uh, living their life, making TikToks, put them into a group feed, mock them, and if those people experience harassment because of it, is that something that Twitter should allow? I'm asking you this without giving my opinion. I'm curious your opinion, specifically for the libs of TikTok, since you opened that door and you wanted to bring up that very thorny issue. Go. Listen, so on, on Lips of TikTok, my understanding of that account is that they only take videos that have already been made public by they're another public, account. Yes. They're all public. They're all public. So they're all in the public domain, and then they repost them. Sometimes they make a snarky comment, but usually they just yep. let them stand on their own. That is not a violation of free speech. Now, mm -hmm. the way that I think these Twitter executives have interpreted it is that they live in such a bubble, and they live in it with such privilege and entitlement that they think that when their point of view gets criticized or challenged, that that in and of itself is harassment. That's not. That is public okay. debate. And they want to make themselves and their points of view immune to public debate. And the way that they do that is that they claim that any criticism is harassment. It's not. If in aggregate, final, final follow-up, if in aggregate those people report being harassed and they have evidence of being harassed, what should Twitter do? Listen. If somebody is harassed, I'm, I'm fine with taking that down. But being publicly criticized or simply retweeted is not harassment, okay? okay? Harassment needs to be targeted and it needs to be more than just public criticism or even a snarky comment here or there. And so you don't consider a not, uh, you know, a, uh, a daily feed of trans people being uh, mocked. You don't consider that target harassment? Got it. Don't listen to me about it. Listen to Twitter's own Slack files about it. Yeah. They knew that the account that lives of TikTok was not violating the rules, yet they suppressed it. They suspended it six times. They knew they were on shaky ground. They wanted to do it anyway. Yeah. Why? Because, they, because be, it's no, because people were experiencing view. harassment. That's why they did it. But it is a thorny freedom of speech okay, issue. Look, I agree with I, you. I think, uh, Go ahead, I think, I think Sachs has articulated a vision for the product he wanted Twitter to be, but I don't think that's necessarily the product that they wanted to create. 
It's not that Twitter set out at the time or stated clearly that they were going to be the harbinger of truth and the free speech platform for all. I think they were really clear and they have been in their behavior and as you know demonstrated through this stuff that came out which to me feels a lot like a we already knew all this stuff this is a bit of a nothing burger that they were curating and they were um, editing and they were editorializing other people's content and the ranking of content in the same way that many other internet platforms do to create what they believe to be their best user experience for the users that they want to appeal to and I'll say, like, there, there's been this long debate, uh, and it goes back 20 years at this point, on how Google does ranking, right? I mean, you guys may remember Jeremy Stoppelman went to DC, and he complained about how Google was using his content, and he wasn't being ranked high enough as Google's own content that was being shoved in the wrong place. And there's a guy who ran kind of, he was a spokesperson for the SEO, the search engine optimization rules at Google. And it was always the secret at Google how do the search results get ranked? And I can tell you, it's not just a pure algorithm that there was a lot of manual intervention, a lot of manual work. In fact, the manual work gets to be the to the point that they said there's so much stuff that we know is a is the best content and the best form of content for the user experience, that they ranked it all the way at the top, and they called it the one box. It's the stuff that sits above the primary search results. And that editorialization ultimately led to a product that they intended to make because they believed it was a better user experience for the users that they wanted to service. And I don't think that, the, that this is any different than what's happened at Twitter. Twitter is not a government agency. They're not a free speech. They're not the internet. They're a product. And the product managers and the people that run that, that product team ultimately made some editorial decisions that said, this is the content we do want to show and this is the content we don't want to show. And they certainly did wrap up um, you know, a bunch of rules that had a lot of leeway for what they could or couldn't do or they gave themselves a lot of different excuses on how to do it. I don't agree with it. It's not the product I want. It's not the product I think um, should exist. I think Elon also saw that. And clearly, he stepped in and said, I want to make a product that is a different product than what is being created today. So none of this feels to me like these guys were the guardians of the internet. And they came along and they were distrustful. They did exactly what, they, they, what a lot of other companies have done and exactly what they set out to do. And they editorialized a the product for a certain user group. And by the way, they never blocked, they never edited people's tweets. They changed how people's results were showing up in rankings. They showed how viral they would get in the trend box. Those were in-app features and in-app services. This was not about taking someone's tweet and changing it. And people may feel shamed and they may feel, you know, uh, upset about the fact that they were deranked uh, or they were kind of, quote, shadow banned. But ultimately, um, that's the product they chose to make. And people have the choice and the option of going elsewhere. And I don't agree with it. And it's not the product I want. And it's not a product I want to use. And okay. I certainly don't feel happy seeing it. But so you want to see you know, products sort of in you want free work to, to summarize it, you want to see the free market do its job. Chamath, you worked at Facebook, Facebook seems to have done, I would say an excellent job with content moderation. I think in large part, correct me if I'm wrong, because of the real names policy. Uh, but you tell us what you think, uh, you know, when you look at this, and the 15 year history of social media and moderation. I think moderation is incredibly difficult. And typically what happens is early on in a company's life cycle, and I, I'm going to guess that Twitter and YouTube were very similar to what we did at Facebook. And it's very similar to probably what TikTok had to do in the early days, which is you have this massive tidal wave of usage. And so you're always on a little bit of a hamster wheel. And so you build these very basic tools and you uncover problems along the way. And so I, I think it's important to humanize the people that are at Twitter because I'm not sure that there are these super nefarious actors per se. I do think that they were conflicted. I do think that they made some very corrupting decisions, but I don't think that they were these evil actors, okay? I think that they were folks who, against the tidal wave of usage, built some brittle tools, built on top of them, built on top of it some more, and tried to find a way of coping. And as scale increased, they didn't have an opportunity to take a step back and reset. And I think that that's true for all of these companies. And so you're just seeing it out in the light, what's happening at Twitter. But don't for a second think that any other company behaved any differently. Google, Facebook, Twitter, ByteDance, and TikTok, they're all the same. They're all dealing with this problem, and they're all probably trying to do 
a decent job of it as best as they know how. So what do we do from here is the question, okay? The reason somebody needs to do something about this is summarized really elegantly in this Jay Bhattacharya tweet. So please, Nick, just throw it up here so that we can just talk about this. This is why I think that this issue is important. Critically. This is a perfect tweet. Still trying to process my emotions on learning that Twitter blacklisted me. Okay, who cares about that? Here's what matters. The thought that will keep me up tonight. Censorship of scientific discussion, permitted policies like school closures, and a generation of children were hurt. Now, just think about that in a nutshell. What was Jay Bhattacharya to do? Maybe he was supposed to go on TikTok and try to sound the alarm bells through a TikTok. Maybe he was supposed to go on YouTube and create a video. Maybe he was supposed to go on Facebook and, you know, post into a Facebook group or, or do a newsfeed post. The, the, the problem is that, and the odds are reasonably likely that a lot of these companies had very similar policies in this example around COVID misinformation, because it was the CDC and, you know, governmental organizations directing, you know, information the, the and rules reaching out to all of these companies, right? So we're just seeing an insight into Twitter, but the point is it happened everywhere. The implication of suppressing information like this is that a credible individual like that can't spark a public debate. And in not being able to spark the debate, you have this building up of errors in the system. And then who gets hurt? In this example, which is true, it's like you couldn't even talk about school closures and masking up front and early in the system. If you had scientists actually debate it, maybe what would have happened is we would have kept the schools open and you would have had less learning loss and you'd have less depression and less overprescription of, you know, Ritalin and Adderall, because those are all factual things we can measure today. So I think the important thing to take away from all of this is we've got confirmatory evidence that whether they're, you know, these folks under a tidal wave of pressure made some really bad decisions. And the implications are pretty broad reaching. And now I do think governments have to step in and create better guardrails so this kind of stuff doesn't happen. I don't buy the whole, it's a, you know, private company, they can do what they want. I think that that is too naive of an expectation for how important these three companies literally are to how Americans consume and process information to make decisions. Incredibly well said, Sachs, your reaction to your besties. I largely agree with what Jamal said, but let's go back to what Freeberg said. I think what Freeberg's point of view is, is really what you're hearing now from the mainstream media today, which is, oh, nothing to see here. You know, that they told us all along what was happening. This was just content moderation. They had the right to do this. You're making a big deal of, over nothing. No, that's not true. Go back and look at the media coverage starting in 2018. Article after article said that this idea of shadow banning was a right-wing conspiracy theory. That's what they said. Furthermore, Jack Dorsey denied that shadow banning was happening, including at a congressional hearing, I believe under oath. So either he lied or he was lied to by his subordinates. I actually believe that the latter is possible. I think I don't think it's true with SBF. It might be true with Jack because he was so checked out. Furthermore, you had people again, like Vijaya Gotti, again, tweeting and repeatedly stating, we do not shadow ban and we certainly don't shadow ban on the basis of political viewpoint. So these people were denying exactly what their critics were saying. They were accusing their critics of being conspiracy theorists. Now that the thing is proven, the mountain of evidence has dropped. They're saying, oh, well, this is old news. This was known a long time ago. No, it was not known a long time ago. It was disputed by you. And now finally it's proven. And you're trying to say it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a violation of the public trust. And if you were so proud of your content moderation policies, why didn't you admit what you were doing in the first place? That's well said. Don't you feel good that Elon's running this business now? I mean, like the things that you're concerned about as a user, as someone who cares about the public's access to knowledge, uh, to opinions, uh, to free speech, this has got to be a, a good change, right? Like this has come to light. It's clearly going to get resolved. Everyone's going to move forward. I mean, do you think that there's penalties needed for the people that work there? Or like, what, what, what's the, no. the anger? Because because no. you won. Like, like I think, I, look, I think we got, yeah. I think we basically got extremely lucky 
yep. that Elon Musk happened to care about free speech and decided to do something about it and actually had the means to do something about right. it. He's just about the only billionaire who has that level of means who actually cared enough to take on this battle. But are and you think, saying that this is a harbinger for I think other he deserves platforms? praise yeah. for that. But I mean, unless Elon can buy every single tech company, which he clearly can't, I, I think, think you guys are right. This is happening a lot of other tech we're, companies. We're about to rewrite the government. The United States government is going to make an attempt to rewrite Section 230. I think that what this does is put a very fine point on a comment that Elon actually tweeted out. And Nick, if you could find that, please, that's a very good tweet where he said, going forward, you will be able to see if you were shadow banned, you were able to see if you were deboosted, why, and be able to appeal. And I think that that concept to be very honest with you, should be enshrined in law. And I think that should be part of the Section 230 rewrite. And all of these media companies and all of these social media companies should be subject to it. And the reason is because it ties a lot of these concepts together and says, look, you can build a service, you're a private company, make as much money as you want. But we're going to have some connective tissue back to the fundamental underpinnings of the Constitution which is the framework under which we all live. And we're going to transparently allow you to understand it. And I think that's really reasonable. Make that a legal expectation of all these organizations. Totally. And, yeah, by the way, and by the way, sorry, the companies, the companies will love it because I think it's super hard for you to be in these companies. And they exactly. probably are like, take this responsibility off my plate. It's just very simple. This is a, there's, there's really four problems that occurred here. Number one, there was no transparency. The people who were shadow banned, taken out of search, etc. They did not know. If they were told, and it was clear to users, we could have a discussion about was that a fair judgment or not. In the cases we've seen so far from Barry Weiss's reporting in the Twitter files part two, it's very clear that these were not justifiable. Number two, these were not evenly enforced. It's very clear that one side, because we, we don't have one example of a, a person on the left being censored when we if we do then we could put balls and strikes together and we could say how many people on one side versus how many people on the other it's pretty clear what happened here because these all occurred with a group of people working at twitter which is 96 or 97 percent left leaning the statistics are clear number three the shadow banning and the search banning and i think this is something we talked about previously chamath it feels very underhanded. This was your point. If we're going to block people, they should be blocked and they should know why. The fourth piece of this, which is absolutely infuriating, and this is a discussion that myself, Sachs, and, Chum and um, Elon have had many times about this moderation, and I'm not speaking out of school now because he's now very public with his position, and, and you know his position he came to on his own. It's, it's not like this is Sachs and I you know, coming up with these positions. This is why Elon bought the business. If you really want to intellectually uh, test your thinking on this, and I am a moderate who's left leaning, I can tell you there's a simple way for anybody who is debating the validity of the concerns here. Imagine Rachel Maddow or Ezra Klein or whoever your favorite left leaning pundit is, was shadow banned by a group of right wing moderators who were acting covertly and without any transparency. How would you feel? If Maddow reporting on, you know, uh, all the Russian co coordination with Trump's campaign did this, or Ezra Klein with whatever topics he covers, and you will very quickly find yourself infuriated. And you should then intellectually, as we say on this program, steel manning, if you argue the other side, it's infuriating for either side to experience this. And that is what the 230 change needs to be, Chamath, you're exactly correct. If you make a, an action, it should be listed on the person's profile page and on the tweet. And if you click on the question mark, you should see when the action was taken, by who, you know, which department, maybe, maybe not the person, so they, they get personally attacked. And then what the resolution to it is. This has been banned because it's targeted harassment. This can be resolved in this way. Then everybody's behavior would steer towards whatever the stated purpose of that social network is. You can get better behavior by making the rules clear. By making the rules unclear and making it unfair, you create this insane situation. Go ahead, Shamath. 
And that's why I'm infuriated about it. I think you have to take it one step further to really do justice to why this should be important to everybody. And I do think this school example, it really matters to me. Like, we have, like, I don't know now, we know what the counterfactual is, which, which is that we have, I mean, we've relegated our children to a bunch of years of really complicated relearning and learning that they never had to go through because of all the learning loss they gave them. But like, what if Jay Bhattacharya, who's, I mean, like, you can't be, you know, have a higher sort of role in society in terms of, you know, population Pretty good credentials. I mean, imagine if, if, you know, there was a platform where he could have actually said this and that, you know, people would have clamored and said, you know what, you and Fauci need to get to the bottom of this. Or where legislators could have seen it and said, you know what, before we make a decision like this, maybe, hey, Fauci, go talk to Jay because he's a Stanford prof. He's probably not an idiot. Why does he think that? Or maybe let's convene, you know, an actual group of 20 or 30 scientists. And the fact that this one version of thinking about things was deemed so heterodoxical, it is just such a good example. They because shut you, down an important conversation. You, you know that the decision was so wrong. And the damage was so severe. Yes. So we know what happened by suppressing that speech. And that's one example. But it's in, in my in my estimation, it is the silver bullet example that cleans through all of this other stuff. Because, you know, I don't really care if Rachel Maddow, Ezra Klein, who the hell cares? This is important stuff because it affects everybody, irrespective of your political persuasion and what editorial you want to read. Chamath, what if the investigation into the Catholic Church and the abuses that occurred there, oh somebody said, God. oh, this person, it needs to be shut down. And then children are molested for another decade. By the way, we have an example of that. Sinead O'Connor came out on SNL. You can look it up for if you're under 40 years old and said, fight the real enemy. She ripped up a picture of the Pope because of the scandals there. She was excommunicated. She was canceled at that time. One of the first people to be canceled because she spoke truth to power. What if somebody, an investigative journalist at the New York Times, the Boston Globes are in the movie spotlight. Those are the people who broke the story of the Catholic Church. If somebody came in and the Catholic Church put pressure on a social network and said, hey, you can't put this stuff up here. You can't here, have this discussion of here's abuse. A, here's, a, here's another example. It's infuriating. Uh, Why are we shutting down discussions in America? Remember the Vietnam Papers? Well, because, because Jake, how the media, the media does not value transparency anymore. If you go back and look at the way that the media portrays itself, like in the, the movie The Post, which is about the revelations about the Catholic Church, or you go back to all the president's men, what the media prized and what they congratulated themselves on was, first of all, ex uh, transparency and exposing the lies of powerful people. Well, that is exactly what has happened here. The lies of the powerful group of people who were running Twitter policy and suppressing one side of the debate has been exposed. And the media is treating it with a yawn, like there's nothing to see here. Why? Because they were complicit in this. They were complicit in suppressing the views of people like Jay Bhattacharya. They were complicit in choosing the views of Fauci and the elite on COVID. And so they have no interest now in bringing, just own in, it. In, making, in making what's happened here at Twitter fully transparent. They have to own it. I think, by the way, just a, just a quick correction there. I think, Sachs, when you said the Post, Washington that, Post, Watergate. Spotlight, exactly. Oh, I might have been thinking about Spotlight. Sorry. It was, may have been Spotlight. Yeah, that's what so I the Spotlight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, like, but the Post is another example. That, that movie was about another event like this, which could have been easily suppressed in today's world. Much Pentagon harder papers. there, which was the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. And in that world, you know, there was an immense amount of pressure that the government put on the Washington Post, but then they said, you know what, we're going with it, and they still published it. And it created a groundswell of support to really re-examine the Vietnam War, and it had a huge impact. But could you imagine this time around, which is like, hey, guys, there's going to be some kind of misinformation. You know, these Pentagon Papers are not real. It's, it's coming from the Russians. Suppress it. And nobody could. It's so much easier Shamath. now right. to run this play. Well, what journalists need to realize is that today's conspiracy theories are tomorrow's Pulitzer Prizes. On to you, Sachs. Not in the current media environment. They work for these uh, corporations, and they don't get rewarded for it telling the truth. 